Now, the last part in the puzzle on acids and bases is the whole idea of indicators. And I know we've been using indicators from day one, um, from the very earliest titration right the way through. Some of you may even have done a titration back in second year, maybe even first year, and you used a thing called methyl orange, and nobody's explained to you until this very moment what an indicator actually is. A little bit of a hint. We're dealing with a chapter that comes immediately after chemical equilibrium, okay? And we've discovered already that by moving the position of equilibrium, we can cause changes, okay? And of course, the movement of equilibrium is due to a stress that's put on the system. So if an indicator has two colors, well, perhaps they are on opposite ends of that equilibrium um, situation, okay? That, equi that dynamic equilibrium. And if I can shift the equilibrium from one side to the other, that's what brings about the color change. So what are acid base indicators. They are simply chemicals that exist in dynamic equilibrium that can be stressed out by an increase in concentration of H plus or OH minus and as a result they kind of speak back to us by means of a colour change when they alter their position of equilibrium. Okay and that should make sense to you from the previous chapter that we did before we looked at um, acids and bases. So an indicator first and foremost is either a very weak acid are a very weak base. Now the problem with weak acid weak bases is that they do not dissociate fully in water. In fact, they're very, very bad dissociators. Or take the Bronsted-Lowry theory, they are bad proton donors and bad proton acceptors, okay? So they're bad. They don't do an awful lot when they're put into solution. But that's okay for us because they do enough to give a color change when we are using them as a point of reference for the completion of a given reaction. So there's an example of a weak acid. If you notice, all of those molecules are acidic molecules. So HCl maybe, okay, let's just say this is HCl. They're all HCl. Notice how many of them have actually dissociated. This one here has dissociated. This one here has dissociated. See that? And in fact, this one here, that's it. So the levels of dissociation are quite little. That's what we mean by a weak acid. It doesn't produce many H plus ions in solution or according to Bronsted-Lowry, it's a bad proton donor, okay? <clears throat> so remember that weak acids and weak bases, they do dissociate, but very, very badly. They don't produce an awful lot of their alternative ions, okay? And on account of that, we get, yes, a dynamic equilibrium set up, but it doesn't go very well to completion. It doesn't go very well to the right-hand side at all. But using Le Chatelier's principle, let's just take a look. Let's look at the dynamic equilibrium that exists in our indicators. If the indicator is a weak acid, the equilibrium equation representing that dissociation is, now before I bring it up on screen, again, please remember what the generic symbol for an acid is, okay? It's HA. But just to, to kind of, I suppose, um, show you that we're using an indicator, which is a weak acid, I'm going to change the formula from HA into HIN. Now, that's just an acidic indicator, okay? And what that will do is it will break up into its ions of H plus and IN minus. Now, mind you, equilibrium will still be way back here on the left-hand side because they don't dissociate very well. However, it's an equilibrium. It's a dynamic equilibrium, which means I can alter the position of equilibrium. Now, let's say, for example, that equilibrium is way over here on the left-hand side. If I want to move equilibrium to the right-hand side, I would have to try and decrease the concentration of H+. And in order to decrease the concentration of H+, I can add in OH-. Because what that will do is it will join with the H+, and take it out of solution as H2O. Meaning that as you add in a base, the concentration of H+, will drop. Now that's the stress, okay? And if the concentration of H+, drops, then the equilibrium begins to move to the right-hand side. And the more base you add, the bluer the indicator becomes. Okay, it makes sense. Now, let's do it the other way around. If I want to push the equilibrium back to the left-hand side, well, then all I've got to do is add H+, increase the H plus ion concentration. Because anything that increases in concentration causes the equilibrium to be pushed away from it. So if I want to move to the red color, all I've got to do is add H plus, in other words, add an acid. And by adding the acid, it will move back 
the equilibrium to the left hand side and the red color will predominate and that's exactly what we're trying to say here in this next slide since the dissociation sets up an equilibrium the position of equilibrium can be moved if you add an acid or a base to that indicator so we'll just take that equation again so when you add an acid you increase the concentration of h plus so by adding h plus this increases now when concentration increases equilibrium moves away so therefore increasing h plus if you increase h plus you'll get a shift of the equilibrium to the left and the red color predominates okay how do i get the equilibrium to move to the right hand side decrease h plus now notice we only focus in on the one stress it's either increasing or decreasing the h plus if i increase h plus i get red if i decrease h plus i get blue and the only way to decrease h plus is to add in OH minus, as we've said already, okay? Because the OH minus will use up the H plus to form water, remove it from solution, hence it'll drop its concentration. So when you add a base, you are adding OH minus. They react with the H plus, they form H2O, and so the H plus ions are removed from their solution. Their concentration drops. Now, if that's a stress, what's the response according to Chatelier's principle? They want to recreate H+. plus, So the equilibrium begins to move to the right-hand side and the blue colour predominates. Okay, So that's at its simplest how an indicator works. It works on the basis of the fact that the indicator itself exists in a state of dynamic equilibrium within the conical flask and is very sensitive to changes in concentration of H+. plus, Either an increase in H+, plus to bring the H+, plus concentration up, or an increase in OH- minus to bring the H+, plus concentration down. So what happens when there are weak bases? Now, if it's a weak base, again, it has an equilibrium. But look, I want to, again, use another symbol. Normally, we used to use BOH, and that's the general formula for any base. But I want to uh, kind of distinguish between that and a base that's used as an indicator. So I'm going to call this simply INOH. And that's just a basic indicator, in case you're wondering where I get INOH from. And in this case, INOH is purple. And the IN plus ion is colourless. And that's the best way I could do colourless was kind of ghosted out. Okay. So you've got purple and you've got colourless. Now, if I can move the position of equilibrium, I can change the colour of the indicator. So let's take the position where I want to go to the left hand side and allow the purple colour to predominate. How do I move equilibrium to the left? And the answer is by increasing the concentration of OH. So if I increase the concentration of OH by adding a base, what will happen? The equilibrium will run away from the high concentration over towards the left-hand side and the purple colour will predominate. Now, how do I reverse that? How do I get rid of that purple colour again and go to colourless? By moving equilibrium to the right-hand side. But how do I move? What's the stress involved? Well, obviously, I've got to try and bring down the numbers of OH-. And the quickest way to bring down the concentration of OH- is to add in H+, which is an acid. So as I add in the H+, it combines with the OH-, removes it from solution to form water, drops its concentration as a stress, and then the equilibrium begins to move over towards the right-hand side to produce the OH+, again, and the colourless solution reappears once more. So by adding in acid and base and acid and base, we can swing the equilibrium from the left to the right and change the colour to our heart's content. So yet again, according to Le Chatelier's principle, the position of equilibrium can be moved if you add an acid. Now, by the way, an acid, that means increasing H+, plus, or a base increasing OH-. minus. So when you add an acid, you're increasing H+, plus, which react with OH and removes them from solution. This decreases the concentration of OH-, minus and therefore moves the equilibrium to the right-hand side. And the colour of the solution is lost, becomes colourless. Okay, there's that solution again, or the, the equation. And when you add a base, you increase OH-, minus, which means that the equilibrium runs away from it towards the left-hand side, and the purple colour begins to appear once more. So that's the mystery behind the weak acid and weak base um, solutions that are being used as indicators. If you remember when we were using them, I was telling you, as I used to go around the lab, no more than a couple of drops of indicator for the very simple reason that a lot of your titrations are acid-based titrations. So if you are adding in an indicator, you're adding in another acid or a base, which can, if they're put in in too copious an amount, 
affect the outcome of the titration. So normally we only use an indicator sparingly, only a few drops in order to see its color to allow a dynamic equilibrium to be set up so that the color can change as the major acid base reaction takes place. Okay. So what indicators do we have in the lab? If you can remember the ones we used, the very earliest days, first year, you may have used a thing called litmus paper. Litmus paper, you dip it into an acid, it turns red, you dip it into a base, it turns blue. Okay, that was the most basic. We then, for our first titration, moved on to methyl orange. Okay, and methyl orange is excellent when you're using low pH titrations. Okay, we then finally, the fifth year and sixth year, move on to a thing called phenolphthalein, which some of you still can't say, and I certainly can't spell, but anyway, that's what it is. We have to deal with it, learn it, because it may come up. So phenolphthalein then works at the upper end of the pH scale. So if you have titrations that are working down on low pHs, i.e. strong acids, methyl orange is your best. If you're working up the other end at high pH values where the strong bases are, well then phenolphthalein is the best. And that's the reason why we had to change. We can't use methyl orange in a reaction that needs phenolphthalein because we won't get the colour change at the exact point that we need it. So there's a little bit of a science behind what indicator we pick, and that's what I want to look at here. So first of all, as I said, we have me, uh, lit, uh, methyl orange, litmus, and phenolphthalein. They're the three we're used to, okay? Methyl orange changes colour between three and five. Now, what does that mean? Colour one is down here, anything below three, and colour two is five and above. What happens between three and five? You kind of get a mix, okay? So you've got one color down here and another color down here. So when we're below three, we get a red color. When we're above five, we get a yellow color, okay? So that's just to show you where the two colors are coming from. Okay, what about litmus? Litmus is one color five and below. It's another color eight and above. And finally, phenolphthalein is one color below eight pH and one color, another color above 10. So those values, are the pH ranges in which these three chemicals show their various colors. If you throw methyl orange into a solution of a pH of three or less, it'll be red. If you throw it into a solution of pH five or greater, it'll be yellow. If you put litmus into a solution that has a pH of five or less, it'll be red. Put it into a solution of eight or more, blue. And phenolphthalein, if it goes into a solution that is less than eight, it'll be colorless. And if it goes above a solution, a pH of 10, it will be pink. So you'll notice then that they're all covering different parts of the pH scale. So if you take your pH scale like this and you go from 0 to 14, which is a part of the pH scale that we normally work on, there is lower, there is higher, keep that in mind, then we can see that from 3 to 5 is usually methyl orange. Okay, From 5 to about 8 is your litmus and from 8 to about 10 is your phenolphthalein. So you can choose which of these three you want to use if you understand what type of titration you're doing. Lower pH um, titrations normally involve strong acids and weak bases, okay? High pH titrations involve weak acid and strong bases. And then you have, of course, what about a weak acid and a weak base? That's a special case that I want to take in its own in a few moments. So for example, in this case here, if we're doing a titration that we know is going to start off at about 6 and raise up to 14, you would definitely use phenolphthalein because phenolphthalein is one colour at 6 and another colour at 14. You certainly wouldn't use methyl orange because methyl orange will be yellow below 8 and it won't change as it goes above 8. It'll just stay as yellow. So we can't use that one. So that's just an example of why we'd use phenolphthalein, anything like that. Now, there are four pH titrations that we want to look at, okay? And a pH titration is one that just looks at how the pH changes as I add, and listen carefully to this, as I add the base to the acid. Now that's unusual. We don't normally put the base into the burette for old reasons. It used to be when the burette was made of glass completely that the base would seize the tap. That's gone because the taps are no plastic, so we don't get that seizure anymore. But the normal thing is the base goes into the conical flask and the acid goes into the, pita, into the uh, burette. In this case, the acid is going to be in the conical flask and the base is going to be in the burette. And here's the reason why. Because you're starting off with a low pH. All acids are down 0, 1, 2. And you want to build the pH upwards to see how it changes as I add in a base. So you're bringing the pH up from whatever it starts off at one, 0, 1 or 2 up to whatever it's going to finish at 10, 11 or 12. Okay. 
So with pH titrations, we said already, the acid is in the conical flask and the base is in the burette. The contents are reversed only for pH titration. So a normal titration of acid base or of um, a redox reaction, it's normally the base that goes into the conical flask and the acid that goes into the burette. So what are they? Well, there's four of them. Strong acid versus strong base. Strong acid versus weak base. Weak acid versus strong base. And a weak acid versus weak base. Now you might say, well, what's all that about? What am I dealing with? Think about this for a moment. A strong acid versus a strong base. If I'm starting with a strong acid, then I'm starting with a pH of about 1. If I add in a strong base, the pH eventually is going to shoot up to something like 13. Okay, so it's a massive change. Now, what indicator can I fit between those two values? The answer is anything, any one of them. I can use litmus, I can use methyl orange, and I can use phenolphthalein. Fe um, uh, methyl orange, 3 to 5, litmus, 5 to 8, phenolphthalein, 8 to 10. They all fit in between these two bookend values. Okay, what about a strong acid and a weak base? Well, a pH of 1, but here you're only going up to about a pH of maybe 9. Now, who doesn't work here? Well, phenolphthalein is not going to work because phenolphthalein is only at second colour above a pH of 10. So phenolphthalein is not going to change. It's going to stay the one colour all the time as you do this titration. The one that will fit between 1 and 9 comfortably is methyl orange because methyl orange has a range of 3 to 5. It's at one colour below 3, good. It's one colour above 5, excellent. So in that case, I'd use methyl orange. Weak acid and a strong base. Here, you're starting off with a pH of about 6 and you're running up to a pH of about 13. Now, pH of above 6. Certainly, methyl orange is not going to work because methyl orange only works between 3 and 5. What about litmus? 5 to 8? Nope, because I need to have another colour above this. Okay, so how about phenolphthalein? Yes, phenolphthalein is one colour down at this end, 6, and it is another colour up at 13 because its range is 8 to 10. So 8 to 10 fits comfortably in between those two values. So that would be phenolphthalein. So phenolphthalein, as we said there, any indicator will do here and methyl orange here. Now, weak acid, weak base. Again, not going to say much until I show you the actual titration curves. So let's take each one individually. We've done this. Here's your strong acid, strong base. Strong acid starts at a pH of about 1. As you add in the base, the pH starts to climb. And all of a sudden, we get this huge jump. Now, that's what we say is the equivalence point. Okay, E-Q-U-I-V-A-L-E-N-C-E. -E. It's called the equivalence point. You don't really have to remember that. Don't worry about it. But it's where neutralization has taken place. Okay, so in here. Now, let's take our indicators. First indicator, 3 to 5. Next indicator, 5 to 8. Next indicator, 8 to 10. So, could I use um, methyl orange? Yes. Could I use litmus? Yes. Could I use phenolphthalein? Yes. So, in other words, all the indicators fit into that equivalence point because we're running here between about 11 and about, what, 1. So, therefore, they all fit. So, any of the indicators are usable in a strong acid, strong base titration. Next one. What about a strong acid and a weak base? Now, we're still starting low, but because we're adding in a weak base, you're going to end low. So now you've got a situation where your equivalence point runs between about 3 and maybe 7. Okay, so let's see who fits. Does uh, methyl orange fit? Methyl orange goes from 3 to 5. Yes. Does litmus fit? About 5 to 8. Nope, doesn't fit. And certainly not phenolphthalein because phenolphthalein is 8 to 10. So phenolphthalein is there. Litmus is there. Nope, the only one that works and fits in comfortably is methyl orange. So you will use methyl orange for a strong acid weak base titration. Next one. When we titrate a weak acid versus a strong base. Now, for a weak acid, we're starting with a high enough pH, roughly about 3. But the key thing is, because we're adding a strong base, we're going to finish high up here at about 12, okay, which is a good strong base. But look at where the equivalence point is. The equivalence point now is between 7 and about 11. So, let's see. Who's between 3 and 5? Methyl orange. Forget it. 
not going to work. How about litmus? Five to eight. Not really. It doesn't fit in there. Nope. So litmus is out. The only one that will work between eight and ten is phenolphthalein. So there's the indicator I'm going to use for a weak acid and a strong base. And finally, I want you to look at this carefully. The weak acid, weak base one that I spoke about and kept you in, um, kept you in suspense until now is like this. What's missing? Now maybe if I go back over the other three, back uh, over the other three, one, two, three. What does that have in the middle? What does that have in the middle? What does that have in the middle? Notice that they all have a, almost a vertical line. Unfortunately, my weak acid, weak base, has no real equivalence point. Very, very hard to find out where the straight line is. So therefore, this type of a titration is actually never carried out because there is no indicator that will allow us to see what we call the point of neutralization or in this case here the end of the reaction all right so we've got four of them we've got the strong acid strong base any indicator we've got the strong acid weak base down the bottom methyl orange we've got the weak acid strong base up the top phenolphthalein and we've got the weak acid weak base with no equivalence point therefore no indicator can be used and they might ask you a question like that state a suitable indicator you look at the pHs that you're starting with and finishing at and see which one of the three fits in perfectly now in order for you to have a look at this I'm going to do one of these for you hopefully this will work properly so let's try this I'm going to touch this site here it should bring me to yep good okay now you can play around with this yourself this is on the slide at the very very last but I just want to show you what happens when we take a strong acid with a strong base sodium hydroxide now let's put in the molarity here as one okay no, one I should say one that's better okay and let's put in the molarity here as two come on okay so we didn't marry there's two so give me a moment there we go have to touch the keyboard okay so now i'm going to choose the indicator well what am i doing hydrochloric acid down the bottom sodium hydroxide up the top let's just stick in phenolphthalein and see if it works okay the burette contains in this case the base uh, the acid is going to be in the conical flask so let's add there we go and start the titration you just touch that and off it goes and we watch carefully we'll see what happens oh I put in minus minus Aha, let's try that again see the wonders of modern technology let it just run through and I'll come back to you in a moment I got that wrong with the two I put a minus in front of the, the one and the two let it run and we'll check it again let's stop it let's go back up here let's take out everything that's from there so we need to take out all of those things so we put a one in there that's better and then we put a two in here okay now let's fill them and hopefully this time with phenolphthalein hopefully now it should do the trick to see hopefully okay so watch the graph watch the graph the base is going into the acid now phenolphthalein is colorless in an acid it's pink in the base watch what happens when the color change takes place here we go here's the line there it is okay and you notice immediately you get the color change now you can play around with this you can take a weak acid and a strong base you can take a strong acid and a weak base play around with it see how it builds the graph and then see why that particular indicator works for that particular titration and one of the best things you can do take a strong acid and a weak base and put in the wrong indicator and just see what happens notice that it doesn't change color so that's your simulation play around with it get the idea that for every specific acid base titration we have we have to have a suitable indicator that is either in the three to five range methyl orange in the five to eight range litmus or in the eight to ten range which we call phenolphthalein